Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are meeting now for the second half of the morning to take a look at an initial proposal of um, some pension design changes. Um, these are uh, we're putting on the table here in committee for consideration um, in order to contribute to a path uh, towards sustainability for our pension system. Um, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity right now with the speaker really committing to, um, to, to pulling together as much one-time money as we can as a state to help put our uh, pensions and OPEB on, uh, on a sustainable pre-funded path. Um, this 150 million is a tremendous opportunity for, um, and it's, uh, it, it is a one-time um, opportunity to, to really make some investments as well as uh, some potential uh, plan changes. And so what you're gonna see here is um, a number of slides, <clears throat> some of which talk about the background, just because I think it's important for us to recognize uh, the, the magnitude of the challenge that we have in front of us, um, and also, uh, you know, some proposals around um, plan changes and a little information about what, uh, how we think that can help contribute to us on a path towards sustainability. Um, I will reiterate before I go to Chris Roop to, to run through the proposal that we're putting on the table that this is, uh, this is just the, the first proposal and we will uh, hear in committee um, reactions from members of the public, from members of the employee groups, uh, from folks who'd like to testify about this. And all of the decisions that are made will be made um, uh, by this committee with the input of uh, Vermonters who want to share their thoughts with us. Um, and so I don't want to, uh, you know, I just want to reemphasize that this is not the middle of the conversation. This is not the end of the conversation. Uh, this is really the beginning and uh, the hard work of um, figuring out what the legislation looks like is going to fall on the shoulders of this committee. So Thank you all for your commitment uh, to doing that with me and um, for your good questions and scrutiny on what John and I are putting on the table here. With that, um, Chris Roop has the um, PowerPoint in front of him and, uh, and he'll walk us through this and we can ask him for clarifying changes and you can ask John and me for uh, our uh, ask John and me if you have questions around uh, the substance or why we went in a particular direction. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Roop, and I'm a fiscal analyst with the Joint Fiscal Office. Today, I will walk you through an overview of the initial pension proposal put forth by the chair and vice chair for the committee's consideration. Just to be clear to those who may be watching this hearing online, now, this is not a joint fiscal office proposal. My role here today is to help interpret and explain the proposal. And uh, for folks who may be watching online, you can access this slide deck on uh, the House Government Operations Committee's website. So uh, moving on to slide two, I, I do see a hand raised, uh, Madam Chair, if, if you want to- Bob Hooper. Uh, Madam Chair, since this proposal is a lot more dense than the first one, maybe, Instead of a trot, we might do a fast walk uh, since it's going to be a lot of information here, I think. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is a lot of information here. And um, I guess what I would say is I welcome folks to um, uh, to jump in with questions um, as we go slide by slide. Let's ask the questions, uh, clarifying questions as we go along. Um, and also, if uh, you know, if you have thoughts on, um, you know, maybe restating something that you think you heard, um, that will also give us an opportunity to, to slow down and make sure we understand this uh, as we go. Mark, did you have your hand up as well? I do. I just, you know, I finally found it, but it's under Chris's name. It's not right on our uh, day page. So if people are looking for it, it's under it's under Chris's name. 
Yeah, it um, it's under documents uh, for Wednesday, March 24th. And there you'll see two documents there that Chris has presented. Both of them are, um, are proposals that John Gannon and I are putting on the table here in committee. Any other questions before we get started? All right, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm on slide two now. Um, this proposal is designed to address the structural challenges facing Vermont state employee and teacher retirement systems by taking steps to reduce future liabilities, increase the pension system assets, and relieve budgetary pressures to improve the state's long-term fiscal health. This is a draft proposal that the committee will receive feedback and testimony on in the days and weeks ahead. This is not a final product by any means. Importantly, this proposal would not apply to existing retirees, active employees who are within five years of current normal retirement eligibility, or inactive vested members. So members who are in those categories would, would see no changes under this proposal. This proposal focuses just on the state and teacher plans and not on the municipal plan because the municipal plan has a lot of fundamental differences from the other two. The proposal also includes all VSERs and teacher retirement groups that are open to new entrants. And it includes risk sharing components, but also components to share gains with employees once the systems improve their fiscal health. Moving Any on to slide- Any questions on that slide? I'm gonna just pause in between, in between slides. Uh, questions? Comments, clarifications, Bob Hooper. Uh, Madam Chair, this I haven't looked far enough to know, but do we have the ability to uh, pinpoint projected savings during the course of the discussion, or is that I haven't looked forward enough to know if that's there? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it is good. Yes. Cool. Uh, Rob Leclerc. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just. <clears throat> The active members who are within five years of current normal retirement eligibility, I'm guessing that will inspire a significant amount of conversation. Um, is there a reason for the five years? Is there any sort of financial reason other than the obvious? Um, so I don't think there's really any magic to that. And in fact, um, at the one of the VSEA meetings that I attended last night, there was a recommendation that we um, that we get much more specific about what we mean by that. But my intention with that is really to say, you know, to those folks who are, uh, you know, in two, three, four years from retirement, you know, like they're making their plans for you know, where they're going to live and what they're going to have to live on. And, um, and I don't think that it makes sense to, to make changes on people who are, are largely, uh, you know, already planning to leave and, right. and go into retirement. Uh, uh, there's the, no magic there. We can decide. What okay. That's like, that's fine. That that's an area that I received significant feedback on as far as the, the formula and those that are currently in the system, um, how much time would they have to readjust their retirement plans? Thank yep. you. Absolutely. Sam LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I be given an example of who an inactive vested member would be? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, um, uh, an inactive vested member would be somebody who um, earned five plus years of service working for um, state government or as a teacher and then left service and, and did not take their, their, they did not withdraw their contributions. So they're not currently working, but they are um, vested and entitled to a retirement benefit when they reach um, eligibility. Does that help? Okay, Bob Hooper. Madam Chair, if you uh, grant me a little liberty, may I respond to uh, the senior member from Barry's question? Um, is it yeah. relevant to understanding what we're talking about on, yes. on slide number one? Uh, well, I don't know about that. It's relevant to his question. It's, it's 15 words. Um, five years of retirement is significant because at the veterans home where we hire nurses and other people like that, 26% of the staff are eligible to leave if they decide to buy five years and walk out the door tomorrow. So, sorry, Madam Chair, can I just ask a question around that? 
you, you can. <laughs> okay, so so is there I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's just is, is so is there currently a provision where people can buy up to five years of their retirement now? Yes, if you have 25 years of service in the system. Oh, okay. So there really is a not that it wasn't relevant before, but there really is a reason for that five year number then. Or could be. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, slide number two. <laughs> Again, my apologies. No worries. We're going to take the time that it takes to get this done. <laughs> so I, I have finished with slide two, and I am on to slide three, making progress. So this slide provides you with some background into the issue at hand and why these proposals are being brought forth. Both of these retirement systems are facing significant and growing unfunded liabilities and declining funding ratios, despite the employer fully funding its required ADAC payments. Right now, VSERS has an unfunded liability of $1.04 billion, and the teacher system has an unfunded liability of $1.93 billion, for a total unfunded liability of more than $3 billion across both systems. These liabilities have increased significantly over the prior year due to a combination of factors that include historic underfunding prior to the Great Recession, lower than anticipated investment returns, changes to demographic assumptions based on plan experience, and revised economic assumptions, including a lowered assumed rate of return. In just the last year, these factors have led to the VSERS unfunded liability growing by $225 million and leading to an ADAC payment that is $36 million more than in FY21. And on the teacher side, these factors led to the unfunded liability increasing by $379 million, leading to an increase in the ADAC of $60.6 .6 million. The treasurer details some of the factors that drove these increases in her report from January 15th. Moving on to slide four. So these are obviously pretty significant increases in costs and liabilities. And there's no Chris, single I'm gonna option. need to pause you right there because I have a hand up. Sure. Chris, I'm always uh, trying to get my, my mind around the actual unfunded liability. And, you know, I see this, uh, uh, figure here, but I, I've heard in the past even as much as a $5.6 billion unfunded liability. Can you explain to me the difference? Is that, is that including OPEB and other things correct. as well? That's okay. correct. So, so that, 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 that higher number refers to all of the, all four buckets of, of retirement obligations. Thank you. And I, I think it's important that we uh, that we start with uh, this background information fresh in our minds, um, because you know we we've heard folks um, you know sort of push back against um, the idea of putting plan design changes on the table, um, you know, in the context of promises made. Um, and I think from the standpoint of the the uh, the general assembly, whose job it is to pay bill for the ADAC each year, um, uh, you know, I would, I would say that we didn't realize that we, we would have to pay, you know, an ADAC that increases by 36 or $60 million in a year. So, um, you know, nobody likes the situation that we're in, um, uh, but we are looking to try to find the right combination of changes that will make this more sustainable for uh, for the general fund as well as um, for the retirees and beneficiaries. So uh, any other questions on that slide before we go back to the next one? All right, go ahead, Chris. All right. Well, on slide four now. So these are obviously pretty significant increases in costs and liabilities. And there's no single option that will make these go away or drop back to FY21 levels. And charting any proposed path forward will likely require multiple options and some painful and difficult trade-offs for both members and the state. But when thinking about charting a path forward, it's often helpful to think about where you wanna end up and how you wanna get there in order to maintain focus as proposals evolve. So the development of this specific proposal was guided by a set of principles or goals. First, it was guided by the principle that providing retirement security to Vermont's public sector workers and their families must be maintained in order to ensure that the state can attract and retain a talented and effective workforce that provides so many critically important services to the state. It was also guided by the principle that any changes to the system should exempt existing retirees and those close to retirement who are already planning for their future. 
It's also guided by a principle that pre-funding retirement and OPEB benefits is a prudent long-term strategy for funding long-term obligations. And this strategy should be pursued to the greatest extent possible. Consistently fully funding these obligations in accordance with the funding schedule is key to making progress toward paying off these long-term obligations and shoring up the fiscal health of the state. Any changes to retiree benefit systems should consider what impact those changes may have on the behavior of the existing workforce, especially those who are near retirement age already. This proposal is also guided by the principle that the long-term preservation and strengthening of the retirement system will require participation from all participants, and that these costs are going to keep increasing in the future and putting more and more pressure on the budget unless necessary changes are made. So the time to make those changes and put the state on a stronger path forward is now. Moving on to slide five. In totality, this proposal reduces long-term pension obligations by proposing the following modifications to the pension benefit structure. The proposal modifies the cost of living adjustment structure, increases the number of years considered when calculating an employee's average final compensation, increases the vesting period to be eligible for a retirement benefit, and changes the eligibility criteria for normal retirement while also making related adjustments to the maximum benefit formula to account for additional years of service that the workforce may accrue. The proposal also increases assets into the pension system by increasing base employee contribution rates across all employee groups and implementing a supplemental progressive risk sharing employee contribution that would be triggered by the overall performance of the pension fund. The proposal also allows for a shared risk, shared gain provision for the COLA structure based on pension fund health. And notably, the proposal calls for a significant investment of state revenue above and beyond the ADAC amounts to pay down the state's long-term retirement liabilities. So that's the high level. Let's now look at the specific details. Moving on to slide six. Let's start off by looking at the cost of living adjustment formula. Currently, retired members receive an annual COLA that is tied to the consumer price index and the full amount of their pension benefit is adjusted. This helps pension benefits keep pace with inflation over time. For most members, there is a 1% minimum and 5% maximum on the COLA, and the COLAs start applying once a retiree reaches normal retirement eligibility. In other words, if you retire early at a reduced benefit level, the COLA typically does not apply until you reach the normal retirement age. Under the proposal, the COLA stays, but it would only apply to the first $24,000 of retirement benefits. This $24,000 threshold is slightly higher than the average retirement benefit being paid out in either system. The proposal would also standardize the COLA formula across all plans by tying it to 100% of the CPI and keeping the 5% annual maximum in place, but it would eliminate the 1% minimum increase from all plans. Lastly, the proposal calls for implementing a COLA once a retiree reaches 67 years old with the exception of VSERS Group C, which would be pegged at age 60 because Group C has an earlier normal retirement eligibility age than other groups. And to add some clarity to all this jargon, I've added a box here at the bottom of the slide that gives you a high level description of who is in which of these pension groups. So VSERS Group C is the law enforcement and public safety group. VSERS Group D are the judges. Old Group F is the state employees hired before January of 2008, and new Group F is state employees hired after January 2008. On the teacher side, Group C1 are members who were at least 57 years old or had at least 25 years of service on June 30th, 2010. And Group C2 are the members who had less than 50, who are less than 57 years old and had fewer than 25 years of service as of June 30th, 2010. Bob Hooper has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Is is this removing the one percent? Does that indicate that it's possible for the cola to go negative? Uh, I don't believe there's any element in the proposal that changes the existing language in statute about um, colas going negative. Um, the the only element to this proposal is if the CPI is at some positive number that is less than one percent. That, that positive number less than 1% would be what applies and not 1%. Thank you. Um, this, this would seem to indicate that somebody who 
started very early in their career, uh, could, let's say 20, could put in um, 47 years before they were eligible for a COLA and they probably would have retired a long time before that. Um, is there, is there's a fluctuation in maximum benefit they can receive or is it going to be limited in future slides? <laughs> you, you are, you, we will cover that topic in future slides. Okay, and we're, we're, not, uh, we're not stepping into the age discrimination area here, right? Uh, I believe we're treating everybody equally here. Okay, thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, I hope this is a quick answer. Do we know how many people we're talking that are in the old group F currently? Wasn't there oh, like 80 <clears throat> something could, or? We could get that information for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I can say that the vast majority of the VSERS workforce is in group F, either old or new. Um, that, that's the overwhelming majority of, 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 the, of the members. Yeah, I seem to remember we took that testimony last week, perhaps from the treasurer's office, um, director of retirement. I'll see if I can find that. Thank you. You're right. I'm sure I You're have right. it written down somewhere, but I'm, I'm trying to focus on the meeting at hand. Otherwise, I'd go rifle through my papers. Um, <clears throat> Peter Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, remind me, uh, Group uh, C, which is uh, distinguished by the earlier um, uh, retirement age, that's, uh, is it all public safety classified or only the uniformed officers, the sort of line officers, uh, as it were? Uh, th that, that's a great question. I'd have to go back in the statute and find the specific um, definitions of, of who is included in that. I think Bob knows, but. <laughs> go ahead, Bob, if you know. I think it's certified law enforcement officers and the unit that you're in. I mean, there are some in supervisory units, some in some, <laughs> some inspecting funeral homes, some inspecting beauty parlors. It's, it's a pretty broad range, but it's all certified law enforcement officers. Okay, thanks. Tanya Vihovsky. Two questions. One might actually be for Bob. Um, wh where do game wardens fall in this list? I know that we have talked previously just about their work being very remote and sometimes actually potentially more dangerous than some of our more. They they have full police powers. They are certified. Okay, one so they fall into that same group. Thank yeah. you. My other question um, is how the twenty four thousand number was arrived at. Um, so the, the principle that we're trying to follow there is, um, is not to, not to have, uh, an outweighted impact on people that are on the lower end of that, um, retirement income spectrum. So I think Chris said that the average is, uh, 22,000. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. It's $21,060 for visas and 21,964, um, the teachers. That's based on the, the most recent valuation study. And it's in Yeah, thank you. I just, 24,000 is still a pretty low number. So I was just wondering how that's where we, how we landed there. Yeah. All right, any other questions on the COLA threshold slide before we move on? Yeah, please. Uh, I, I just said, because I heard last, night at the chapter meeting that it was indexed, but it's indexed to tied to the inflation rate, whatever it is. The, the, the CPI, yes. Okay. I believe it's the, the CPIU if you want to get very specific, but mm -hmm. that's that's for the, the urbanized markets in the Northeast. All right, Tanya Vihovsky. Um, was there any looking into the impact that this might have on our retirees accessing other state services? If we are going to pull a COLA away from someone who's bringing home $24,000, are they then going to be eligible to access Medicaid or be needing other supports so that we're just displacing this money? Um, that's certainly a good question that we, uh, that we should ask in committee. And Madam Chair, if I may add to that, um, I, I just want to clarify that uh, if you earn over 
uh, the $24,000 threshold, that doesn't mean you would receive no COLA under this proposal. It would mean that only your first $24,000 of benefit would be subject to the COLA. And yes. um, most, if not all, uh, Vermont employees also participate in Social Security. Awesome, thank you. No, I'm actually more concerned about the people who are earning just that 24% and the removal of the 1% minimum. All right, next slide. All right, we're on slide seven. Uh, so the proposal also calls for increasing the number of years considered when calculating a member's average final compensation for the purposes of determining what their retirement benefit will be. Right now, AFC is calculated by averaging the three highest consecutive years of salary with a few exceptions. For VSERS Group C, it's the second highest consecutive years. And for VSERS Group D, it's based on the final salary at retirement. Under the proposal, all groups would have their AFC determined by averaging their seven highest consecutive years of salary. And for VSERS Group C, the annual payoff for unused leave would be excluded from the AFC calculation to mirror the terms already in place for other employee groups. So can you, um, can you just give an example of, uh, of the, kind of, um, the kind of scenario under which somebody in group C um, might, uh, might see a change? Sure, so um, the, it, a, a longer um, salary history would be considered when, when determining what the, what the AFC would be. So in many cases, and, and you know this doesn't apply across the board, but in many cases, um, uh, an employee's final years of employment are often when their highest income is. Um, by averaging a broader range of years, um, considering this, it has the effect of resulting in a number that is more representative of an employee's overall salary history and mitigate some of the impacts that may occur from unusual spikes in final years of employment. So that would be the most significant impact that uh, members would, would see as a result of this change. Rob LeClaire. So would collective bargaining agreements weigh in on this? For instance, um, let's just say hypothetically that you had an employee that had accumulated a lot of paid time off and was able to roll it over year to year to year, um, could they uh, selectively and strategically take some of that time and have that counted into their uh, annual salary? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, I'm not as well versed in all the ins and outs of the, the collective bargaining agreements, but you know, I think right. there's, there's any number of hypothetical scenarios that any employee, regardless of these changes, can leverage their, their, their personal time or their, their leave payouts um, you know, in, in their overall compensation, not just for, for purposes of determining AFC, but just in general. Okay, so, so it is subject to collective bargaining um, agreements. I, I'm, I'm just not sure if this is stipulated in the contract or not. Okay, yeah. thank you. We want to stick a pin in that question. Um, that is definitely something that we will need to explore in the context of, uh, of this proposal. So thank you for bringing it up. And, um, and I'm not sure that we have a real firm understanding at this moment, which of these uh, might uh, present a collective bargaining issue and which might not. Um, so we'll keep coming back to that. Other questions before we move on? All right, take it away, Chris. Okay. We are now on slide eight. The proposal calls for a modification to the vesting period, which is the number of years a service member must accrue in order to qualify for a normal retirement benefit. Currently, the vesting period is five years for all groups. The proposal would increase the vesting period to 10 years. Bob Hooper. Uh, Madam Chair, if you just may enlighten me as to why on this one, uh, it's Every time we've looked at it before, it's been cost neutral. Is there a, a, another issue that brings this forward? Nope, just putting an idea on the table. I mean, I, I understand that there isn't a, a necessarily a great, um, a great deal of change that it makes in terms of our long-term liabilities. Um, it, it has a tendency, I think, to be an unintended consequence in, in times we've looked at it before of once somebody gets five years in, they're less likely to leave. 
um, that threshold is now going to be a third of their career or more. So it, it may very well have a, a personnel impact that we should hear from the commissioner on because uh, we're going to have enough trouble hiring people to begin with there. Yep. All part of the conversation. Any other questions on the vesting slide before we move to the next one? All right, go ahead, Chris. We're on slide nine now. The proposal also calls for changes to eligibility for normal retirement. Right now, most employees must reach either an age or a combination of age plus years of service in order to, in order to retire with an unreduced benefit. A notable exception is VSERS Group C. Those members may retire early without penalty at age 50 with 20 years of service, and they have mandatory retirement at age 55. But since members can retire earlier than age 55 without penalty, as long as they have 20 years of service, many do so. Under the proposal, the pension systems move to an age-based eligibility where the employee must reach the full Social Security retirement age to qualify for normal retirement. Currently, that age is 66 or 67, depending on the year in which someone is born. The Rule of 87 and Rule of 90, which currently allow employees with more than 30 years of service to retire with full benefits at ages younger than 60, would be eliminated. For VSERS Group C, the existing mandatory retirement at age 55 would be maintained, but the ability to retire earlier without penalty would be eliminated. Any questions on the normal retirement eligibility slide? Uh, yes, ma'am. Since I know I'll get a question, what is, is it a normal actuarially determined reduction for the plan C earlier than 55? How's, what are we looking at? Uh, if if I may, Madam Chair, I think that's a, that's a topic of open conversation for the committee to consider. Um, whether, whether it's to, to maintain it in an actuarial reduction form, um, you know, with early retirement or, or to do away with the ability entirely. I think it's, it's very much an open question. Thank you. As you will recognize as we go through these slides, we, were, we are opening up, um, uh, you know, a thousand points of decision making for this committee to, uh, to embark on. And uh, that's why it made sense to put a put a proposal on the table as a starting point, as opposed to trying to build this from scratch. Cause that, that sounds like, um, that sounds like shopping for furniture at Ikea where you, where you come with a thousand pieces and you hope you can figure out how to put it all together. Um, Peter Anthony. Bed in a box. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I, I wanted to uh, sort of expand on your observation. Um, I think, I've sensed that the idea of the actuarially determined adjustments in the context Chris just mentioned and Bob commented on, but also in the context of buying years of service is problematic. Um, if, if we have failed to anticipate actuarially correctly in the most recent past, I'm, I'm willing to bet that the calculation of how much you buy your years has also been uh, unfortunately missed the mark as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would double put a pin in that <laughs> subject because it's not clear that we're or our actuaries are terrifically good at um, putting a number on buying years actuarially. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, good point. Any other questions before we? move on. Chris, go right ahead. Right. Looking at slide 10 now. So in recognition of the fact that these changes to normal retirement eligibility would likely result in many members accruing more years of accredited service, the proposal also calls for adjusting the maximum benefit payable cap. Right now, the various pension groups cap their maximum benefits at different percentages of average final compensation. For example, VSERS Group C at the top of this chart accrues pension benefits based on a 2.5% multiplier per year, and they are subject to a maximum benefit of 50% 50, 50 of AFC. That means that an employee hits their AFC cap once they work for 20 years, because 20 years times 2.5% equals 50%.
The proposal does not call for any changes to the benefit multipliers already in place for any members, but to address the fact that the proposed changes to normal retirement eligibility may increase the longevity of many employees, the proposal calls for increasing the maximum benefit cap by 1% for every year that a member works beyond the year at which their benefit multiplier times their years of service hits that cap. The proposal also calls for reducing the maximum benefit that VSERS Group D can earn from the current 100% of final salary to 60% of AFC plus 1% escalator for each year work beyond 18 years. This would make Group D comparable to the other groups under the proposal. Does that make sense to folks? Understanding that if we are on the one slide going to ask folks to work longer, that we ought to also make it possible for them to continue to get some benefit out of that. Peter Anthony. I was going to say <clears throat> my additional highlight of that is uh, there are enough incentives for people to retire. It would be nice for people to have an incentive to, to work right up until they feel uh, they're no longer capable or uh, their spirit is not in it. Thanks. Yeah. All right, next slide. Right. We're on slide 11. So those are the key elements of the proposal that addresses the liability side of the equation. The proposal also contains items that help improve the pension plan's funding status. The proposal calls for increasing employee-based contribution rates across all groups. Currently, employees pay fixed percentages of gross salary, and that percentage varies based on plan. The proposal calls for increasing the contribution rate for most VSERS groups by 1.1% to 7.75% of gross salary, with a lower rate of increase for Group C to bring them to 8.75% in recognition of the fact that their rate is, is already higher than, than everybody else's. The proposal also calls for increasing teacher contribution rates from the 5 or 6% currently in place to 7.25% of gross salary. And again, like with other elements of the proposal, active employees within five years of current normal retirement eligibility would not be impacted by the changes uh, proposed to contribution rates. Questions, we'll just take a momentary pause there for any clarifying questions. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks, uh, I just, um, because it was mentioned uh, as recently as um, uh, late last week, just to distinguish between changes which will change the unfunded liability as opposed to changes which will encourage uh, accumulation through cash flow of the size, the corpus of the uh, uh, fund, investment fund. This falls on the side of increasing the uh, growth, if you will, of the uh, asset fund. And I, I guess I just want to be sure that those rates that you have ticked off or suggested for discussion, uh, I, may, people may throw darts at me, but is it high enough on the sense that I also know, I sense that we have been incurring expenses in a way that was not adequately covered by the, in quotes, normal contribution uh, levels. And I just want to be sure uh, as, as Roger Dumas, uh, among other people, said, the worst thing you could do is start essentially eating your capital. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I just want to be sure, uh, surprisingly, uh, me to ask that this is, this is enough to make sure that those costs don't uh, outstrip this within the next decade. Thanks. Yeah, and Madam Chair, if I could, if I could take a stab at, at addressing that, um, you know, I think it, just to be clear, the additional employee contribution rates, the primary effect that would have would be paying for a greater share of the normal cost. Um, you know, right now, the, the remainder of the normal cost that is not fully covered by employee contributions, which is roughly half of it, falls on the employer to pay through the ADAC payment. So um, increased employee contributions would have the impact of, you know, would, would have the practical effect of um, providing a little bit more of the, the, the coverage on, on the normal cost 
and uh, relieving the employer of paying that burden. And, and just to clarify, the, the unfunded liability right now falls squarely on the employer. Thanks, Chris. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you for your tolerance, Madam Chair. I'd like to put a pin in the previous slide because it, the old Group F and the new Group F look strange to me in terms of uh, the new proposal versus the old proposal. And on this particular slide we're on now, none of which have a number on Chris, so. <laughs> um, I, I seriously hope we get cost and the other numbers that we've asked for from the treasurer's office because I still see a glaring difference in benefit versus cost uh, here from an equity okay. proposal. And Representative Hooper, if I may, um, thank you for looking at the last slide. Um, I did find one typo, which um, under new group F in the proposed, that should be 1.67% multiplier with a max of 60% of AFC, not 50% of AFC. That's exactly, yeah, okay, thank you. Mark Higley. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, you had just talked about now the uh, employee contribution uh, being such a smaller percentage of uh, the employee contribution. Um, is there any provision or could there be a provision uh, regarding uh, you know, uh, looking at it when that percentage reaches a certain point. I mean, I, you know, again, we're, we were, I thought we were hopefully considering going forward with this without, um, you know, running into this problem again. And I just, I just wonder if there's a, a percentage break that, that the employee contribution should be considered again. That, I think that's a really open question for this committee to discuss, um, you know, I, I think just for some context, you know, the the normal cost um, for, for both groups exceeds 10% total, including what the employee and employer pays. So, you know, I think determining what share of that normal cost should be paid by whom is, is an open question for this committee to consider. Thank you. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Well, <clears throat> without jumping ahead here, but without jumping ahead here, doesn't the uh, the next screen, the employee risk sharing contribution kind of address that issue somewhat? Yeah, yes and no, um, it, it, it would bring in additional revenue, um, but I'm, I'm not sure it addresses the full question. I think they're, they're separate questions. Ready to move on folks? All right. Okay, we're now on slide 12. So in addition to increases in the base employee contribution rates, the proposal includes a new risk sharing contribution that would be assessed in addition to the base contribution rates when the health of the pension fund triggers it. The proposal calls for a tiered contribution rate where the more an employee earns, the more they pay. And it would work similarly to income taxes where income within certain brackets is taxed at different rates. The proposal calls for these risk sharing contributions to kick in if the investment performance of the specific pension fund falls below a target defined as the assumed rate of return plus half a percent. So in real life, this target would be 7.5% based on the current assumed rate of return. Here's how it would work. Every year, the investment performance of the two most recently completed fiscal years calculated based on the actuarial value of assets would be averaged together. If the average is above 7.5%, no risk sharing contribution would apply for the upcoming fiscal year. If the average is below 7.5%, the risk sharing contribution would apply for the upcoming fiscal year. So if this were put in place today, the investment performance of the fund during FY19 and FY20 would be averaged to determine whether the risk sharing contribution would apply for FY22 and the process would repeat annually. Under the proposed income and rate structure shown here, the vast majority of the workforce would be subject to a risk sharing contribution of less than half a percent. Okay, so this, um, this 
gets us into the concept of risk sharing. And so I want to make sure that people understand, you know, at first blush, what this is trying to accomplish. Um, Bob Hooper. So I assume, even though it says proposal for the two systems and all groups that we're still keeping the unfunded liability and earnings and everything else discreet to each group and an assessment would be made on each group independent. We're not looking at an overall state liability and making a, an escalation to every retiree that's covered by these two plans, correct? Um, that is the decision point that we will have to make if we want to get more. Are you, are you suggesting that, that being more refined in how this is applied across? Well, I'm not talking about within the state plans uh, because they are unfortunately homogeneous. And I still believe that there's more unfunded liability generated by one than the other. Uh, and I'd like to look deeper into that, but I'm wanting to make sure that because it says a proposal that includes both the state employees and the teachers, that we're keeping those two systems discreet. And if the teachers run up a lot of unfunded liability, they're not going to be bleeding over into the overall state obligation and everybody gets a boost in their contribution. Right. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Comments, anybody want to jump in with a clarifying point? All right, uh, Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I found most of my questions, so we are going to finally be looking backwards to try to have some anticipation of what we're looking at going forward. Um, in the example here, if the actuarial determined amount, let's say using the seven and a half percent, let's say that that isn't realized for say the two years. Is there anywhere in this that that number would be addressed? Um, I think I need you to say that again in a different way. I mean, these are all decision <laughs> points that we have before us here as a committee, um, you know, the mechanism for how we're basing the risk sharing sure. is, is a, a first proposal. Yep, no, that's a very fair question, Madam Chair. Um, uh, part of the reason why we're here today is that uh, look, the actuarial numbers have not proven out as far as the investment earnings, correct? So using this seven and a half percent as an example about the cost sharing, looking back the two years, we're gonna say that, that the plan did not realize the seven and a half percent return, correct? correct? If so, that's when the cost sharing would kick in. But is there anywhere that we would go back and address the assumptions going forward to say that, well, the seven and a half percent hasn't been right? Maybe we should lower that number. And does that change anything going forward? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I understand your question. Uh, you know, Madam Chair, if I may, um, you know, I, I, th I don't think there's any element of this proposal that changes the way the assumed rate of return is currently evaluated. Um, you know, the, the language that's proposed here would, um, would, would the trigger is defined as, um, you know, whatever the assumed rate is at the time um, that this analysis is happening, plus, you know, 0.5%. So, you know, it may not be 7.5% all the time. It may fluctuate if the assumed rate of return fluctuates. I do think there's a great deal of risk to the plan if uh, the decision of what the appropriate assumed rate of return is, is influenced by whether or not um, the risk sharing contribution would be applied. Um, you know, I, I do think a, a different level of, of uh, evaluation needs to occur on what the appropriate assumed rate of return is that's separate from um, the consideration of what impact that will have on contributions. And, and this, has been, this has been a challenge that, that other states have had to wrestle with, but it goes back to this concept of, you know, the fiduciary uh, duties of, of the governance structure. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, as Chris just did, 
that part of my good friend from the town's uh, question really goes back to uh, how you share or not share or vest the uh, um, imposition or the adoption of a uh, actuarially uh, determined um, uh, rate of return. Uh, so this is not, you know again to cross back and forth between governance and and not. Um, but where I was going before I, I had to say what I just said is uh, back to Bob Hooper's question, when you have uh, noticeably unequal um, contributions, shall we say, to the unfunded liability between the, the mega groups, that is to say, uh, VSTERS and VSERS, uh, it, it occurs to me just as a starting proposition that it, wouldn't be very it would not be very difficult relatively easy to essentially divide the <clears throat> burden of the risk uh, proportionately to who is uh, uh, um, showing the least uh, um, uh, conformance with the expected um, actuarially uh, determined um, uh, uh, um, pathway to reduce the uh, unfunded liability. In other words, some will perform, I'm sure, uh, more successfully than others as between the two. And I don't see why you couldn't, as a starting proposition, say, by the way, the risk and or the um, trigger, if you will, to change contributions would be proportional to whoever is not performing in that proportion, if you will, between the two mega groups. Other questions, statements, clarifications that folks would like? All right, next slide. Okay, we're on slide 13 now. On a similar theme uh, to the risk sharing uh, contribution uh, that we just discussed on the previous slide, the proposal also includes a shared risk, shared gain provision involving the COLA threshold. Remember from earlier in the presentation that the proposal calls for setting a threshold for applying the COLA on the first $24,000 of benefits. The proposal calls for allowing the threshold to increase above $24,000 based on the CPI once the pension fund reaches 85% funded. If the funded ratio declines below 85%, the threshold would be frozen at the level in place at the time until it gets back above 85%. In practice, this would work by looking at the funded ratio and CPI during the most recently completed fiscal year. That would determine what the COLA threshold would be for the upcoming calendar year. So if this were in place today, you'd look at the funded ratio and CPI for FY20 for determining what the COLA threshold would be for calendar 2021. This provision aims to share some of the gains back to the members who would be asked to shoulder some of the sacrifice for improving the health of the pension fund. Questions. What would, that, what would that raise, quote unquote? If that were applied today, what would the impact be on the employees' contributions? For for the shared risk, shared gain model, I don't think it would have any impact on employee contributions. It would it th this would just allow the, the COLA threshold to increase above twenty four thousand dollars. Say again, I didn't. So th this provision on, on slide 13, I don't, I don't believe that would have a direct impact on employee contributions. This, is, this would trigger um, the increasing or, or maintaining the, the $24,000 COLA threshold. Oh, so, oh, 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 okay. I'm unfortunately still back to slide. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Sure, there's a good answer to this, but why would we not want the plan to be 100% funded, why 85? I, I think that's an open question for, for the committee to consider. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a, there's a wide range of opinions on it is 100% is the ideal number or is there another number that, is, that might be slightly lower but makes the, the liabilities you know, easy to manage on a budgetary um, situation. So I do think it's it's a fair question to ask. Um, I think this could be set any way that the committee would, any direction the committee would like to take. But if the fund is reaching 85%, you know, it, and I'm painting with a real broad brush here, 
but um, generally your unfunded liability is not going to be so great that it's completely unmanageable to pay off over an amortization schedule. And just for folks who are following along at home, can you remind us of what percent funded each of the, the two systems are that we're sure. looking at here? Sure, the uh, VSER system is 66% funded right now. The teacher system is 51% funded now. And those ratios have uh, continuously declined um, over the last decade. So this would be an aspirational target to um, substantively improve the health of both of those funds. Follow-up question, Rob? Um, well, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to be the least little bit difficult here, but I'm thinking that wouldn't the aspirational target look to be 100% funding? Because just hypothetically, if I had a plan that had a billion dollars in it, even at 85% funding, I'm still $150 million arguably unfunded, aren't I? You are, you are. And, and I, I think, you know, go, going back to, I think it's, a, it's an open question for the committee to consider. And, sure. you know, the, the, the length of time it may take to reach 85% funded, um, you know, what, to what extent will um, inflationary pressures transpire between now and then, I think is, is another consideration as well. Okay, yep, thank you. Peter Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, to go back a couple of weeks, I think I uh, was a bit um, uh, worried in the context of Mr. Pelletier's first presentation about risk sharing of being of over, um, uh, overly uh, sensitive in reacting to performances and overshooting and undershooting. And I think the answer to my good friend from the town is if you were at 100%, uh, what would you say if you cross that threshold and you all of a sudden were at 110%, that is to say more than covered the liability, what do you do, right? Refund checks to, I, you know, I think having a cushion but being close is much, much, uh, much preferred so that there's room to maneuver, so to say, but you don't over collect, thanks. Other questions, comments, clarifications? John Gannon, I thought maybe you had your hand up earlier, but um, but perhaps someone else already made your point. No, I, I was just gonna note the the funded ratios that we have and that you know the 85% target was something that I think is achievable, whereas 100% um, might not be achievable in the near future. Um, so I think that that's just some of the thought is that this is something we could maybe hit versus whereas 100% um, might be sometime way in the future. But, you know, this is something that could change in time if we do achieve 85% um, funding is to move that number up um, to still encourage um, us getting to a full funded stake. Yeah. Uh, John just walked into what my comment was going to be. Um, Fundamentally, I believe there's no such thing as a fully funded retirement system. You might hit 100%, but because you're going to turn around and make adjustments to the, the soup over the course of the next year, um, that 100%, as it has done in the past, could turn into something very different very quickly. So uh, we got into this bind because... Uh, former treasurer, former chair of the Appropriations Committee and a couple of governors said, oh, we're at 100%. We didn't need to worry about paying this bill. And uh, that's contributed mightily to where we are today. So 100% is no magic number in my book. Questions, comments, or clarifications? All right. Okay, so on to slide 14. In recognition of the importance of addressing the state's long-term liabilities, and in combination with the other elements of this proposal, the proposal also calls for the state dedicating a total of $150 million above the ADAC payment to pay down the state's four major retirement liabilities. By investing these significant one-time revenues, those funds can grow with interest during the remainder of the amortization period. 
And as those funds grow, they hope to close the unfunded liability while relieving some of the future budgetary pressures caused by ADAC payments. And over time, the funding ratio of the plans will improve as those funds grow with interest. Slide 15. Here is a summary of the preliminary oh, fiscal I've got a, Hold on, I've got a hand up, Bob Hooper, go ahead. No, today you've got a pain someplace uh, because you mentioned the four major retirement liabilities. And I always want to take exception to the retirement system versus paying for retirement benefits because we seem to be talking about the retirement system here. And when we start to talk about this ADAC and OPEB eating into this $150 million, the significance of what we're going to do here is potentially reduced a lot. I mean, as we took testimony on, OPEB is a, an obligation, um, or OPEB is a, a discretionary thing. Our retirement system is an obligation to pay. Uh, and I think Wall Street looks differently on that. My stepping off my soapbox. Appreciate it. Come back with the rest of us. <laughs> Go ahead, Rob. I swear there was no coordinated effort to make this the Bob and Rob show. <laughs> um, is the, the, the $150 million that we're talking about injecting into this, is that over and above the escalating ADEC amounts that are on that actuarial for the 2038? Yes. So, so that's over and above the, act, the amounts that are going to be escalating going forward as well. That, that's Is right. There, it's over. It, the proposal calls for that funding to be over and above the ADAC, and by by dedicating additional one-time funds, you know the amortization schedule of the unfunded liability between now and 2038 will likely change as well. Well, that was going to be my next question: Is would it be reasonable to expect some return on that investment to affect the ADAC payments going forward? I I believe that would be a reasonable expectation. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, other questions, comments, observations? All right, cruising right along. All right, slide 15. Here's a summary of the preliminary fiscal impacts from the proposed revenue increases. As I just mentioned, the proposal calls for $150 million that can be used to address the four major retirement obligations, the pensions and the OPEB for the state employees and teachers. For some context though, for every $50 million you invest today, that could grow to $153 million by the 2038 amortization date if it consistently grew at 7% every year. And each one-time increase of $50 million above the ADAC would by itself immediately increase the funded ratios of each pension plan by more than 1%. But the impact of this investment will grow over time as the money grows with investment gains. The proposal also calls for increased base employee contribution rates a 1.1% increase for most VSERS employees and a one and a quarter to two and a quarter percent increase for most teacher members. Although the teacher proposed increase is slightly higher than that of the state employees, the proposed rates would bring the teacher contributions closer in parity than they currently are. And the teacher system is significantly worse off financially than the state employee system is. For some context, every half a percent increase in employee contributions generates approximately $2.8 million for VSERS and about $3.3 million for the teacher plan. These numbers will grow over time as payroll grows. If you extrapolate out from these estimates, the proposed increase for VSERS would generate approximately $5.8 million in additional revenue to the VSERS pension system, and the proposed increases on the teacher side would generate roughly $12 million. And these are preliminary estimates based on the size of the overall payroll. They are in the ballpark, but they've not yet been adjusted for the exclusion of active members who are within five years of normal retirement eligibility. It's a little trickier to model what the future revenue would be from the risk sharing contribution structure because salaries change every year and we don't have a crystal ball to know which years the fund's performance would trigger the contributions to take effect. But the proposed structure would result in an effective risk sharing contribution rate of less than half a percent for the vast majority of the workforce. Questions on that? So a lot of a lot of words, a lot of numbers on that slide, um, but just want folks to have an understanding of roughly how we 
how we calculate the impacts of these changes. And obviously when we come down to um, a more final decision about how we wanna move forward with this, we will cost it out again um, if we've made significant changes. Uh, oh, look, it's the Bob and Rob show. Uh, Bob Hooper, <laughs> you got your hand up first. Uh, we're, we're, Jim has us running a little game on the side here. So we, we didn't get into March Madness. We're getting into this. Um, so the treasurer has repeatedly, oh, first, let me say, I have no objection to prefunding OPEB at all. I think it's a wise fiscal decision for us. Uh, I just don't know that this section of federal fund mix up should be used for it. Um, Treasurer has said a lot, and I believe it to be true, that raising contribution rates doesn't have that much of an immediate impact on unfunded liability. That's correct. Is there a threshold where that tips and it, it actually starts to have a more dynamic impact than the smaller amounts that we're talking about? Uh, that, that's a great question. I think that threshold is probably higher than than any of the rates under under consideration right now because the the employee contributions fund the normal cost and not the unfunded yes. liability. So yes. um, these additions would would pay for a, a slightly larger share of the normal cost and it would relieve some ADEC pressure on the employer um, because part of that part of that ADEC payment is you know in addition to the installment payment on the unfunded liability it covers the remainder of the normal cost that employee contributions are not sufficient to cover. So you just, you just tipped on the iceberg that I wanna to get to. Uh, it, traditionally in this, when we talk about differences in uh, the actuarial evaluation at the end of a fiscal year, um, the, the, the interplay between parties that are paying as one goes up, the other has a tendency to go down. And if our, because it's basically a cost shift, not necessarily a cost share. So if we're looking in the future to have the unfunded liability decrease as quickly as possible, why are we not throwing something in here that seems to establish that as contributions from employees go up, it's matched by contributions from the state so that we're both kind of reaching our goal and all this burden is not falling on the people that we're actually paying to uh, work an extra 20 hours of overtime so the unemployment checks can go out. That makes sense? Um, I think that long story short, um, the, the remainder of the bill gets put on our uh, on our desk and we have to figure out how to pay it, whether you call it a, yep. our share of you know, our equivalent pain with uh, with the increase in the employee contribution or whether you, uh, whether yeah, it the, simply remains. The point I'm, I'm trying to probably inarticulately make is that uh, we have a tendency to stay level when we talk about the contribution interplays. And, uh, you know, it would be nice if we raised one side of the seesaw that the other side of the seesaw went up also. Um, and a lot of times when one group's contribution increases, it offsets the burden on the taxpayer, which isn't a bad thing, uh, but it doesn't move us towards fixing the problem as quickly as we could. Okay. Rob LeClaire. Um, I'm going to have to reformulate my questions here, Madam Chair, so I'll raise my hand again going forward. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Peter Anthony. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, in the back of my mind is what the what's a way to manage the pressure on the general fund as we accomplish what we hope to accomplish. And I'm so I'm sort of thinking along Bob's lines of whether, um, for instance, in prefunding um, OPEB the treasurer had a plan which included uh, what I'll call balloon payments in the near years, I think it was three years, to put in some excess 10%, I think over what normally uh, we would. And I'm just wondering whether or not we can't digest that balloon payment in part of our uh, overall approach so that we go to the 3% 
glide path sooner rather than later. I say that because it leaves more room in the general fund to make extra ADAC payments, uh, say in year two or year three, uh, without doubling up, so to say, on top of the 10% that the treasurer had in mind uh, uh, hitched to her ODAC submission, submission, OPEB, excuse me, position, sub, sub, uh, submission. Uh, I would just want to, uh, I'm trying always to think of rooms, of, uh, uh, ways to have room to maneuver so that we, when we get a successful year, we really can bank a lot of it uh, if we choose to. Uh, right. But if we don't have a good year, obviously we don't have the choice. So I'm just saying, let's leave as much latitude in year two, three, four from when we adopt whatever we adopt uh, so that we can essentially, as Bob says, when the contributions go up, we can also uh, bump down, so to say, the unfunded liability by an extra contribution. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Rob LeClaire. There, Madam Chair, I think I have my questions formulated. One, um, this, this $150 million, is that all inclusive? In other words, is it including the 20 million initially that we were talking about for OPEB? Or is this geared primarily towards the pensions? Because I see that there is a line here that says funds could also support funding of OPEB. So are uh, we talking 150? Are we talking 170 million potentially? So Chris, why don't you break that down a little? Yeah, I would, I would have to clarify with my colleagues in JFO whether it's 150 or 170. Um, I can tell you that the 150 is included in the big bill language that was just introduced yesterday. And um, the, the language that, was, that, was, that framed it um, did not designate it for any of, you know, any dollar amounts for the specific buckets. You know, I think that the funds were reserved um, that could be used for some or all of the four, um, the four retirement liabilities that we're, that we're discussing. I, I would be interested in the answer to that question if we're talking 150 or 170 million. I mean, realize it's only 20 million, but it only. might be a good, good, right? And yeah. the other question I have, and I think it's a little bit along the lines of my friend from the city, in doing what's being proposed here, I guess on page 15, where we increase the initial payment by 150 million, um, there is an increase on the employees, for lack of a better expression, um, side of things. Where in the, I guess, the 2038 amortization schedule do we start seeing an impact on the ADAC payment as far as how much of it's got to come totally out of the general fund versus how much of it could be offset by income from investment. Does that make sense? Do we know that? Is, has that been done? Do you know? Chris? I, I'm trying to understand your question. Um, I'm not I'm not sure that sure. specific analysis has been has been run. I can tell you that you know the 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 unfunded liability is is recalculated every year um, yep. and investment performance goes into that calculation. Um, yep. from the prior year. Um, statutorily, the unfunded liability needs to be paid off by 2038, and the statute stipulates that the payments increase by 3% a year. So I think the intent behind that was, um, you know, to, to try to make sure that they, they remain somewhat level as a percentage of payroll and, as, and they grow as, the, you know, the overall growth of, of the budget um, from year to year. But um, when you look at the valuation studies every year, the actuaries will take a snapshot in time and look at, you know, what money do you have right now? What was your investment performance and how big is the gap? And, and they reprogram right. that, um, un that, that amortization schedule every year. So that's sure. part of the ADAC payment. The part that's okay. a little harder to project out into the future um, in a great distance is the normal cost. So right. you'll typically see um, in, in the valuation studies, you know, they know what the what the unfunded liability is and how many years there are left to spread it out over, but they will only provide an estimate for the normal cost for a much smaller window. Right. But that 3% increase in the ADAC payment, that didn't anticipate 150 million plus million, um, one time infusion of capital either, did it? It, it did not. And, and that's why these numbers are recalculated every year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ready to move to the next slide? All right. 
So uh, slide um, 16. Bob Hooper has his hand up. Well, following up on my friend, the questioner's question, if we put in this $150 million, we're going to see a reduction next year when the actuary comes back to us and says what your overall normal and unfunded liability cost will be, right? Uh, it would likely show up in the in the um, unfunded liability more so than the normal cost. And, you know, I think, I think it, I'll, there's a lot of variables that I wouldn't say it will necessarily go down because nothing's guaranteed in life as we well know, <laughs> but the, the investment performance and, and, you know, the experience factors will all go into that calculation. Sure. But those things being equal, the bill that appropriations is going to get next year should indeed be significantly lower than the one they got this year. I, I think it depends on how you define significant and the timing of when the funds are invested. Um, you know, it, I think the impact of it will, will, will grow over time um, as, as the money grows over time. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you that I think I would hesitate to say it's guaranteed to go down by X. Um, I think we would want to see what the actuaries put forth um, in the next in, in evaluation study that includes the impact of those funds. Thank you. Peter Anthony. I, I, uh, Chris just concluded, I was going to say, because we've decided to go to three years intervals instead of five, we're going to see a new one relatively soon. And depending on what we do with the proposal uh, before us today, uh, never mind the government side, but the benefits side, that will figure into the revaluation in the next year, year and a half. And even if we did not do anything but the benefits, that should show up in the refiguring of the actuarial projection of the unfunded liability, never mind the ADAC payments. Thanks. All right, ready to move to the next slide. All right, we're almost finished. Slide 16. These charts show you some preliminary actuarial modeling around the fiscal impacts from the proposed changes to retirement plan design. The cumulative impact of the changes is on the far right side. And you can also see the impact of each specific proposal for lowering the ADAC payment and accrued liability. These models are preliminary. Although they include the impacts of excluding all actives who are within five years of normal retirement eligibility, there are a few elements of this proposal that were not incorporated into this model. Proposed changes to VSERS Group D are not included in here. And those changes would generate some additional savings beyond what's reflected here. The proposed increase of the maximum benefit cap of 1% for each year of service work beyond the current maximums is also not factored in. That will likely result in a slightly lower savings than what's reflected here in the age-based normal retirement estimates. And these models do not factor in the impact of the additional employee contributions that are proposed, which would generate approximately you know, five and a half million for VSERS and 12 million for the teachers and would further reduce the ADAC beyond what is shown here. So I think these are, this is my disclaimer of saying that these are preliminary numbers that, you know, I think, I think further modeling based on based on where the committee wants to go will tighten these up. But these these are pretty solid estimates about dollar impacts cumulatively of some of the major elements of this proposal. Moment to digest that and give you a chance to raise your hand, Rob LeClaire. Okay, so I believe I understand this. So this. This is strictly around the cost savings that you would realize based on the prior recommendations. It has nothing to do with the anticipated revenue increase from the investment side. Correct. Good, very good, thank you. Other questions? Uh, just to keep up, Madam Chair. Um, Yes, Bob. I was digesting numbers and I didn't hear if you said why group D is eliminated from the top chart other than complexity. Uh, they, not, they, they, yeah, we, uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, group D can be added to the model. Um, it just in order in order to eliminate in order to limit the number of scenarios and the complexity of the work, they weren't included in the first round. Um, they can certainly be factored into subsequent work. Um, and, and group D is, is a relatively small universe yeah. um, compared to the overall system. I think it's, you know, don't, don't quote me on the number, but I believe it's less than 60 members. So the impact will be there for equity purposes, but the impact for financial purposes will be 
tiny. Sure. Thank that you. is a good way to summarize that. Yes. Other questions? Go ahead, Rob. Sorry, I should ask this the first time. Um, the where you have the cumulative impact of the changes. Um, let's say if we go to VSERS, the A deck, the minus thirty four point seven. That's an annual number. That that and number is based on savings based on what the FY twenty two A deck is currently right. projected to be. And then the savings under the cumulative for the liability of the two hundred and looks like ten million. Is that based on the 2038 amortization schedule or yeah, that's every, just a everything's based on based on the existing amortization schedule and these numbers all show the differences from um, the FY22 values. So um, just for some context, um, recall on a previous slide that for FY22, the ADAC for VSERS was projected to increase by $36 million over FY21. This is essentially saying that out of that $36 million increase, 34.7 million of it would be reduced, um, you know, give, give or take um, based on these preliminary numbers and uh, same type of equation for the liability increases. Very good, thank you. All right, next slide. So slide 17, let's wrap things up. Preliminary modeling shows that the full range of proposed changes to VSERS would lower the ADAC by roughly 34.7 million, and the VSERS accrued liability would be lowered by roughly 210.5 million. And again, these are all preliminary estimates. For the teacher system, the full range of proposed changes would lower the ADAC by roughly 45.7 million, and the accrued liability by 308.6 million. And these are solid but preliminary estimates subject to the caveat I just mentioned. But overall, when you factor in these changes to the benefit structure and contribution rates, the increases to the ADAC from FY21 to 22 for both systems due to assumption changes would be largely eliminated and the unfunded liabilities would be significantly reduced by more than $500 million in total across both plans. So that's the end of my overview and the walkthrough of the proposal. And if any members have specific questions um, that, I, that you haven't already asked, um, I'm happy to answer them. And, with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Chris, for, um, for helping to present this proposal. Um, let's do a few questions, and then I'd like to um, make sure that we have a little committee discussion here about, uh, about how we move forward with the next steps of hearing from folks. Uh, so uh, Bob Hooper, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize for taking up so much time, um, but I'll take up a little more. Uh, in the context of what we're doing here, um, we're, we're, we're basically doing a corrective action. If I have an infection, I take an antibiotic for a while, and then when the infection goes away, I stop. Um, these are pretty drastic changes. I think they will impact our ability to be competitive in the uh, ability to gain workforce members, nurses, specialized computer programming people in the future. And when I talk about the future, I'm talking decades after we're gone. Um, I think we should talk about building a sunset of some sort into this because this is a corrective action and it's dealing with a particular problem that we had, which is an unfunded liability that is excessive and there might be a point, hopefully in the future, where the unfunded liability goes away. And I'd like to at least consider uh, this not being a uh, remedial thing that continues to drag us down. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm kind of going uh, a little bit where Bob went, although not quite as immortal as I think he is, <laughs> um, in did the sense say, that... Did you say immoral? Immortal, um, oh. immortal as in demographics, uh, you recall. Anyway, um, it occurs to me, uh, I know uh, the ch Madam Chair and Vice Chair want the proposals in the two buckets, that is to say governance and the revision in uh, both the contribution side and the benefit side to uh, s sort of follow the same legislative path. Uh, I'm 
what I'm, um, I guess I'm, uh, given the uh, conditional language of Chris, I'm saying to myself, you know, if we did do what you're suggesting and we did have uh, the revised government structure and we did have a commission um, that essentially had plenary uh, authority, I really would hope we would constrain that in some way so that we have a little time to see how we're doing on the side that we just finished the 17 slides on. Because I, I would hate, since we made a drastic move from 7.9 to seven in the expected rate of return, I would hate for the new governance structure to all of a sudden adjust that without having seen whether or not in the coming, say, three or four years, assuming we are adopt a robust version of what's on the table now, to sort of see how that sugars out before we uh, try, uh, try to, uh, you know, two adjustments chasing each other, so to say, um, would be unwieldy and and uh, unwelcome and in some way, in some sense, mystifying. Um, that is to say, not helping transparency and and public faith, support, and confidence. Um, so I, I hope it would, we put the brakes on the revision of the, the uh, actuarially determined rate of return for a bit since we just drastically changed that and see whether uh, Chris's uh, the most rosy picture or less rosy picture uh, follows from what we do on the benefits slash contribution side for a few years. Um, till we get some s settling out, so to say. Thanks. Tanya Vyhovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am sort of looking at this and it feels like we are changing everything all at once. And the scientist in me wants to sort of pause that. I mean, we're asking, it, we won't know what made a real impact. We won't know what impact it's going to have because we're asking people to work longer, pay more, get less we're gonna pay more. It just feels like a lot really quickly and sort of on what Peter's saying, we're already making some changes and it seems like it makes sense to go slower and see what impact those changes have before we put forth such a deeply impactful plan that impacts our capacity to attract workers and for our workers to, it just impacts every aspect of this program for them. It just, it feels like a lot. Other questions, comments? Um, Mike Merwicki. Yeah, um, I, I hear that piece about going slow, but I, I think what I've been hearing through all this is this situation is not gonna get better on its own. And waiting is not gonna help the unfunded amount get smaller. And is Chris still here? So I, I'm going to admit my own lack of expertise in this matter, but that was pretty much a general statement. Is this going to get better on its own if we wait? I, I do not believe it's going to get better on its own, no, sir. Can I just follow up really quickly? I'm not suggesting we do nothing. I'm suggesting we maybe don't do everything, that we, we use sort of a more measured approach to choose something that has an impact and see what impact that has before we throw everything at it. My books. I think I blipped out there for a moment. Uh, last I heard, you're in and out. Suggesting. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Um, I think Mike McCarthy was next. Yeah, and I hope my uh, connection is going okay, Madam Chair, because I I froze for a second too. Thanks. So um, yeah, I I really appreciate all the work that went into laying something on the table. Um, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to taking the time to look at each one of these policy levers and to hear feedback on it. My reaction to the idea that it's sort of a lot is that 
it seems like instead of trying to find one silver bullet solution, there's a lot of levers being pulled a bit um, in order to have a cumulative impact that's that's actually makes a difference on the huge problem that we have. Um, so I'm hoping we are able to make that difference and that it, it does pay off for the kind of impact that we want in terms of predictability and reliability and for people to be able to count on these systems working in the future. I also had a thought when we were talking about governance that um, I really wanna make sure that we can count on the assumptions like the rate of return, for example, being made based on what we think the assets are gonna earn rather than putting the choice in the context of a bunch of other political decisions that are being made about plans, et cetera. It's like, if we're empowering a group to say, what do we think this rate of return is gonna be? And they're factoring in a whole bunch of other things in that thinking, um, then I don't know that we should trust that rate of return. So I, I appreciate the, the combining of both the governance and some of these plan changes as we move forward. I'm Gannon. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, just to follow up on Mike's comment, I, I do think we need to look at both sides, governance, as well as benefit changes. I mean, on the governance side, you know, if we don't start meeting our assumed rate of return and our other actuarial assumptions on a consistent basis, um, some of this work will be for naught because they will still have increasing unfunded liability. Um, to address Tanya's question, um, and the treasurer has talked about this, um, in order to pre-fund OPEP, we need to achieve a certain level of, of savings in the pension system. So if our goal, and we can decide as a committee that our goal is not to pre-fund OPEP, um, you know, we do need to achieve a certain amount of savings in the pension system in order to do that. Um, so, I mean, that, that is something we all need to think about, um, is what, what ultimately do we want to achieve here? Now, I've heard some people say, well, you know, there's no contract for, for retirement health care, um, but some people may view that as a very important um, component of their retirement. Um, so I think, you know, that is a decision this committee is going to have to make. Um, so, yeah, we could take it very slow and only achieve a, a small amount of savings in the pension system. Um, but then you have to look at what we're going to do with respect to OPEP. Thank you. All right. Um, questions, <clears throat> comments, clarification? Bob Hooper. Um, Chris, when we look at the preliminary physical est fiscal estimates slide, that, that excludes contribution increases. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. The contribution increases are not reflected in there. So, so the impact of those would, would move those numbers higher. Um, and, and that's because the, the contribution increases, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of a straight mathematical exercise yeah, to figure yeah. out how much money that's going to generate. And you'll, you'd see that show up in um, the ADAC savings. Um, you would not show, you would not see that show up on the liability line. Um. Okay. And, uh, you know, I somewhat agree with John. We, we really, it is a really responsible thing to do to address the OPEB stuff. I just think it's confusing the whole process here to have them both uh, thrown into sort of the same barrel. Uh, you know, we could throw a new bridge in for that matter. I think it would sort of be the same thing. Um, but Prefunding new bridges is a good thing too. So, how <laughs> uh, Colston? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this is a very complex exercise, as we can all attest. And it, I think it could be interesting if we were to have some scenarios of how this could play out, almost in a like a dashboard presentation so that we can see if uh, plan A or plan B or plan C or D, how they compare and, and, and have a better sense of the impact of what these changes would look like. Um, so I'm just wondering how that could be accomplished, but 
that would really help me kind of get my head wrapped around it in a better way to see um, how we actuate these different levers and how it really plays out. So if I'm understanding your your desire for information is you you want to know, is this a little lever? Is this a big lever? Is this a medium sized lever in terms of its uh, ability to do work on the ultimate problem? Exactly. OK. Um, yeah, I can see value in understanding that. And um, uh, we can work with Chris to try to figure out how to how to put some uh, relative scale on the levers, right, Chris? Yep. And, and if, it, if it's helpful, um, uh, you know, it may be helpful to review this proposal next to the, the treasurer's report from January 15th to, to, to refresh your memory mm -hmm. on, on sort of the scale of impacts. Um, you know, recall that she put forth several scenarios with, with really the, the, the goal of trying to reduce that FY22 ADAC and liability increase back down to FY21 levels. And, and you could see a range of options that um, she asked the actuary to cost out and, and what that translates to into dollar terms. So um, that, that may be a helpful exercise um, for putting some context around um, what this proposal looks like in relation to some of the other levers that, that have been explored. Thanks, Chris. Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a hands-on learner, that would be very helpful for me, even though I know it's not going to be hands-on, but just seeing like, if you do this, this is what this is what you see. And I understand reading and comparing side by side is helpful, but again, for someone that likes to see the things in front of me, um, that would be very helpful. I know the other day, the member from Barry Town asked to see like, basically, you know, what uh, Rep. Colston just, I just asked for, like, can we see in, not in real time, but in a, in a very good estimate, if we do this versus this, what's that going to project out to? Um, and I think that would be very appropriate um, for us to be able to obtain. Because um, I, I, I appreciate the proposal coming forward, but I feel that um, if we want to tweak something that we need to be able to also have the resources to see what is going to happen like maybe some of the proposal had to, to get here. Thank you. Yep. So Chris, maybe we can work on that comparison document for um, for some point a few meetings from now. And I and I don't put a time on that because I have no idea how much committee time we're going to get relative to the uh, backlog on the floor. Um, and we do want to hear reactions from uh, from the impacted folks around the governance proposal um, before we come back to this. Um, and I think it would be helpful to hear uh, another round of reaction to the, the plan changes um, before we come back to really understand. So in other words, you, you have a day or two, Chris, before we're gonna need to see that. Um, John Gannon. Thank you. So um, yeah, it'd be nice to, to have a side by side with some of the treasurer's proposals just so we can see what those look like. But slide 16 does show the impact of various levers that we're pulling and what their impact on AD, ADAC is and liability. So you can at least take a look there um, to, to see what the various impacts are. Now, so, some of them, when they're in combination, have a different impact than if they're by themselves. So that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, so it's not, you know, if you pull one thing out, it, it can actually impact other levers as well. Peter Anthony. I, I guess um, um, I'm all for trying to create a sort of matrices of if you do this, this is the savings that you accrue. <laughs> I, but I must say, I'm, I'm speaking for uh, consistently for the the voice that said, you know, if you see an inequity, now's the time to fix it, which with all due respect to my uh, colleague from Essex, you know, uh, if you don't do that, you'll say, gee, I wish I had done that in the process of. And so it looks like we're doing a lot of things, but frankly, some of them are done for fairness reasons, not because they're going to bring us a lot of money. Uh, and, and I'd hate to I'd hate to throw out a fairness one just because 
it's not going to buy us, but a million and a half uh, in in um, uh, ADAC savings. I, I just think this is one of those once in a lifetime chances. And as you can see, the inequities have sort of crept in over 30 years of building pension funds history. And that's too, that's, you know, it's just the way the history works. And once in a while, you have to have a, a sort of a reboot, <laughs> as it were, and say, does this really make sense? And I think we're at one of those moments. So I, I still want to protect the equity element in our work, I suppose. That's my point. Thanks. Uh, I think it's fair to say we suspected that uh, that equity was important to folks and the decision of uh, whether we stick with this or make changes to to this aspect of it uh, certainly is uh, one of the decision points on the table here. Um, Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, respond back to Vice, uh, Vice Chair's comment. Mine was more towards what the end of you, which, which you were saying was if something is removed or example of just the vesting, um, you know, where the proposed is from five years to 10 years, but what if we said just seven, what would that look like? Just things of um, in real time changing, um, not not um, what we already have out. I, I appreciate that slide and I have looked at it, but it's more of if one thing changes, how is that going to trickle out to the rest? So I appreciate it and thank you very much. All right. Um, so any last questions, Mike Merwicki? Well, th thank you, Madam Chair. I'm um, not sure whether the, the group is ready to, to wrap up or not, but I have a commitment to meet with the school group now. So I'm gonna take off for now and I will see you later. We do have a number of folks who have noontime meetings, um, and I want to respect that we also have a caucus of the whole um, going on to help folks familiarize themselves with the capital budget and the, the big bill. Um, so, uh, Steve Howard, thank you for jumping into this meeting. It was a little difficult to predict how uh, how how we would pace ourselves getting through these two different um, proposals this morning. And, um, and so since you're here, I, I wanna just reiterate what I have said to the committee previously about our plan going forward. Um, we would like to hear from, uh, from BSEA as well as uh, the teachers union the, and the troopers union and, and the judiciary on the governance structure um, changes. Um, we will get to that this afternoon if we are off the floor by four o'clock. Um, but if we are on the floor later than that, which I understand there's a fair chance we will be, um, then we're not gonna come back to committee at dinner time, for instance. So uh, we, we are a little unsure of, of what time we'll get back to committee and what time we'll um, get to each of these steps, but we would like to hear from, um, from the employee groups on the governance proposals first, uh, then we'll hear from a couple other perspectives on governance, and then um, uh, whenever we can, we'd like to get back to hearing a reaction from each of the groups on the, the plan design um, proposal. Does that make sense, Steve, in, in terms of um, how you all will uh, fit in in the next steps. Um, I think so. Uh, so what I what I think I heard you say is that um, uh, you are going to hear from us. This, are you still here planning to hear from us this afternoon? If we're off the floor by four o'clock, yes. But if we're not off until after four, then I, I don't think that gives us enough time to, to really that. hear a first blush reaction from everyone. Um, a little discombobulated because I've got, I've got, I just popped out of a meeting because they said they wanted, you wanted to hear from me, but I wasn't sure what you wanted to hear from me about. So, yes. <laughs> so we would like to hear from folks on governance first, um, and we'll go through the, the first round of uh, hearing from folks on the governance proposal, and then we'll come back to the pension plan design proposal, which, um, you know, at the rate we're going uh, may not be till Friday. 
All right. So uh, a number of people are texting me that they have noon meetings and, and need to go. So um, thank you all for your uh, long uh, uh, attention to this and your hard work. And um, hopefully I'll see you in committee this afternoon. Um, I committee, just for your information, um, we may try to start tomorrow morning at 830 in order to buy ourselves a little more time since we um, since we have judicial retention. So uh, keep an eye out and I'll ask Andrea to email everyone a, a revised agenda if if we make that change.